We are sorry that the 0906 service to Red Car Central via Middlesbrough has been further delayed and is now expected to arrive at 09. Great. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Looming taller and taller over British politics is the discussion going on in these houses, in this neighbourhood, which will choose its next MP next week. 69.5% uh, Brexit to leave, one of the highest areas in the country. Yet, at the 2019 general election, it didn't fall from Labour to the Conservatives. Do you think this guy's different, Boris Johnson? Oh, yes, I do. I think he cares more for the people, probably, uh, whereas Margaret Thatcher didn't. They used to say that they weighed the Labour vote in seats like Harleypool rather than counted them, but that's all changed. This port town in County Durham is a stark example of the party's electoral crisis. It's got strong similarities with other traditionally working class, overwhelmingly white communities in the North and the Midlands, which voted to decisively leave the European Union back in the 2016 referendum, where Labour's majority has plummeted over the years, culminating in the fall of much of the so-called Red Wall in the 2019 election. Anyone with a Labour rosette could win in seats such as this in England's North East, or so it was traditionally thought, which is why New Labour parachuted in so many of their leading lights to represent these constituencies. In the case of Hartlepool, it was Peter Mandelson. But while communities like Hartlepool often suffer its grim up north type stereotyping, it's so much more complicated than that. While poverty is a major social problem, many of the voters are older, often retired homeowners. This constituency proved fertile ground for UKIP. In the 2015 election, Nigel Farage's party came within 3,000 votes of Labour, who won little over a third of the vote. Two years later, under then leader Jeremy Corbyn in the 2017 election, which is now treated as an aberration to be scrubbed from history, that vote share surged to over half, giving the party its biggest majority since Tony Blair's 2001 landslide. But as the nation polarised over Brexit and Labour shifted to back a second referendum, many of the party's natural voters defected to the Brexit party and Labour's majority fell steeply. Yet the party should expect to comfortably win this week's by-election after the Labour MP was forced to stand down over allegations of sexual harassment, which he denies. Labour still has a bigger majority than it gained in 2015, and opposition parties are expected to do better in by-elections than they do in general elections. In the last half a century, the governing party has only won a seat from the opposition in a by-election twice. The Tory candidate, Jill Mortimer, isn't even local, spent a large period of time in the Cayman Islands and is said to be unpopular with the Conservative machine. I came here to find out what the by-election tells us about Labour's future and the future of the country with it. I spent time with the party's candidate, as well as candidates standing for the Northern Independence Party and the Reform Party. They used to be the Brexit Party. I also spoke to Labour canvassers who told me they came to the party because of Corbyn's leadership and have chosen to remain and asked what was happening on the ground. People feel like that the attention's only on the town when there's something to be gained for national politics. What you've got to take into consideration in Hartlepool currently is there isn't just a by-election, we've got all-out council elections. So... There's a lot of nuances. It's not just national politics, it's local politics too. Part of it, the local Labour Party, I, I'm trying to be kind of apolitical on this, but the local Labour Party haven't helped themselves. They've torn themselves apart over the past few years and I don't think that's particularly helped uh, the party's image. Give yourself a chance. I'm not sure that the Labour message is getting through to people at the minute in Hartlepool. Do you know what the Labour message is? Well... <laughs> We're seeing beer and flags, as far as I can see. Beer and flags. The choice at this election couldn't be clearer. Labour's Paul Williams, a doctor who's worked tirelessly during the pandemic 
in Hartlepool Hospital. Or the Conservative candidate, who will defend the cronyism and the sleaze of the Tories in Westminster. So, I asked the Labour candidate, Dr Paul Williams, for an interview. He said he was happy to do so, but asked me to go through a press officer who said no. So I tweeted about it. It became a newspaper story. Then they changed their mind. So I'm off to have a chat with him. Um, is he, are, you, are we filming no, no, now, no, no, or is that just, just you've been, you been, you been friendly? <laughs> it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a tough year, but you know, this is why this is, you, know, you, you, you want to do stuff to serve your community. Um, I certainly do. Um, but it has been really nice to have been outside a little bit and having chats with people about how to make this town better. Campaigning in Wales ahead of next Thursday's elections, the Prime Minister refused to engage with questions about whether he'd initially secretly got a Tory party donor to pay tens of thousands of pounds the redecoration of his flat above 11 Downing Street. Now, Labour are going in hard over so-called Tory sleaze after Boris Johnson allegedly was loaned money by a rich Tory donor to renovate his Downing Street flat. More seriously, the Prime Minister allegedly said he would rather see the bodies pile high in their thousands rather than pose a lockdown. Pile high they did. Up to 150,000 Britons have died in the pandemic. That's around one in every 443 people in this country. It's one of the worst handlings of COVID-19 on earth. But I asked Paul Williams, is Labour succeeding in making all of this cut through? People here want to do an honest day's work for fair pay. And it cuts to the sense of fairness that there seems to be one rule for them and, uh, and another for everybody else. And so I think people, it is cutting through. People are, people are angry about it. Um, and... Um, there is a little bit of distrust of all politicians, but actually I think that's really unfair because um, you know, this, 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 these are stories and these are allegations about Tories and, and, and we should, you know, we must work really, really hard to pin this onto the Tories. They're the ones that are responsible and we can't let, it, it's, I think it's their strategy in some ways to try and say, well, everyone's a bit like that. Um, well, we're, we're, we're not. We, we, need to, we need to show, we need to demonstrate through the way that we conduct ourselves that we're, that we're better than that and we wouldn't be like that. But was it wise to do a big video of Peter Mandelson, who resigned from government twice and is a lobbyist? Um, of course there were a few critics, um, but actually, overwhelmingly, the feeling is that he's a, he's, a, um, he's, a, he's a memory of a time when Labour was in power and actually got stuff done. Um, and, you know, he, he was really proud to talk about the record low waiting lists in the NHS, about um, the impact on child poverty and the minimum wage. And, you know, he, uh, Labour achieved things in government and, um, and he's, he's symbolic of that. And I think it's important to rem re remind people that we did good things. Hello, hello. How are you? Hi. I'm Peter Mandelson, standing for Labour, for Parliament. Three tastes of success. Mandelson had a mission to demolish Labour's image as a party dominated by the unions and the left, and he took risks to achieve it. They underestimated Hartlepool, and they underestimated me because I am a fighter and not a quitter. Labour was founded by the trade unions at the beginning of the 20th century to give working class communities like Hartlepool a political voice. And the main divide and how people voted used to be very clear. It was all about social class. Nearly a quarter of a century ago, New Labour forged a coalition of working class and middle class voters to evict the Tories out of office. And policies like the minimum wage and investment in public services did benefit communities like Hartlepool. But under the Labour government, years before the financial crash, wages began to stagnate or fall for those in the bottom half of earners. It was accompanied by Labour shedding votes in its so-called heartlands, like here. Peter Mandelson was one of the chief architects of that new Labour project, a spin doctor who became labelled the Prince of Darkness. But today, an unprecedented age divide has opened up. On the one hand, Labour now overwhelmingly attracts younger voters who are disproportionately private renters, often in insecure and low-paid work, whose living standards have fallen, often saddled with debt if they went to university, and who tend to have socially progressive values. While the Tories, on the other hand, have amassed a huge lead amongst older voters, who tend to own their own homes, 
they benefited from rising house prices, their living standards have been protected by the triple lock of pensions, rightly, and they tend to be socially conservative. Now, in communities like Hartlepool, the number of residents aged over 65 went up by a quarter between 1981 and 2011. That's the last time the census was taken, of course, in this country. While the number of young people fell in that period by a quarter as they look elsewhere for work, often taking their Labour votes to safe Labour seats in urban areas. And that's undoubtedly a process that's only accelerated in the last decade. But after generations of loyalty to the Labour Party, does that all just get scrubbed away? Young people do view that there are jobs but they're not the jobs of the calibre that they want. And if you encourage children to go to university, then really they want something better. And we just didn't have those high quality jobs. There was a lot of leakage across the whole of the Tees Valley, not just Hartlepool. I mean, do you think that's part of the problem that Labour faces? Because the generational divide in politics is massive now, and older people are more likely to vote Tory, more so than ever, younger people more likely to vote Labour than ever before. But in places like this, the number of people over 65 has gone up a lot. Mm. But the number, the number of people under 25 has gone down a lot as well. So yeah. is that part of Labour's problem that they rely on younger voters, but younger voters are leaving places like this and uh, an older population which is more predisposed to the Tories stays behind? No, I don't, I don't think it is anything to do. I think they just feel let down. I think, like, you know, in Hartlepool, it's more to do what was what has happened locally and it's had a huge impact. I've, I talk to people all of the time and they just don't see that there's any continuity, any security within the Labour Party. So they feel as if what they represented decades ago is very different from what they represent now. Because this is a Labour town, essentially, it's, it's always been as you know, for decades. Those voters have shifted, but they still remember the Tories. <laughs> and they'll, they'll just never, ever vote Tory. Because uh, we come across it on the doorstep all the time. Um, and, you know, in terms of uniting the vote, if we all want to get Labour out of Hartlepool, which is the consistent message I'm getting on the doorstep, then what we need to do is get behind the party that can do that and unite those two voters together. So what's going to happen then is your role is to help allow the Tories to win because no. you can you can win over Labour voters, the Tories can't. Yeah. And in doing so, bring the Labour vote down enough yeah, for the Tories but there to are, win. Yeah, there are a lot of Tories that are not happy with the way that they've run things over the last year either. So there's some of them that are looking to shift. Okay. So we're looking to grab both votes. Obviously, it's been a Labour constituency for a long, long time, but I think, you know, under Labour, there's been a big decline in the town, and I think it's been a safe seat for a lot of years. And I think um, the town is ready for a change, and I think, re reading between the lines of what I'm hearing, I could go Conservative for the first time. You can, you can get this frustration of, well, Labour have taken our votes for granted, um, no longer. Um, we're sick of this. We're sick of seeing our towns with the shops shut up and we're sick of lack of investment in our schools um, and infrastructure. You know, our buses don't run after half past six. You know, you, you can feel the anger um, in them and, and them wanting to make a different choice. People look from Hartlepool and they see the work that the likes of Ben Houghton's doing as the Tees Valley Mayor um, he's whether a conservative. You, yeah, and he's a conservative. And whether you like him or Lord Ben, he's a doer. And people see that he's, he's delivering on his election pledges. And also, he's doing the one thing that Labour politicians and other politicians haven't done for Hartlepool in many years, and that's talk the area up. Um, we were fed up of being talked down and being told, well, we used to have all this and we don't have it anymore. And look at all of the things we've lost. And all of a sudden, you've got somebody like Ben who's saying, yeah, we might have lost shipbuilding, but we're going to do X, Y and Z and giving them something to look forward to. And I, when you speak to voters now, they're seeing the investment that's going into Redcar, which has, has recently got a, a Conservative um, MP and, and the likes of Darlington. And people on the doorstep are kind of thinking, well, I wouldn't mind a piece of that. Well, as I say, I think it's always for the working man, if anybody, the Labour, and it always has been. I'll tell you something I didn't vote for. The mayor, the mayor I still voted for, Ben, who's in now, because I think The Conservative? Good. Yeah. Okay. I think he's been good, so I did vote for him. So here's to God, 
Queen and country. Happy St George's Day, everyone. Labour faces another threat in the region in the shape of Conservative Ben Houchen, who won the Tees Valley mayoralty in May 2017. Houchen's clearly popular locally. He's proving something of a gateway drug for Labour voters into the Tory fold. He's a savvy politician. He campaigned for the local airport to be brought into public ownership. He boasts of securing investment from the Conservative government. The new Tories have repudiated austerity. They're turning on the taps in seats won by the party, leading to accusations that they're pouring money into Teesside but neglecting Labour voting communities in the North East in an effort to consolidate their new base. Now, Houchin successfully secured Freeport status for Teesside. That means tax reliefs to encourage jobs, but critics believe those benefits are drastically overstated. Nonetheless, it has clearly led many to forget years of Tory cuts. I think that was the thin end of the wedge. And once we had a Conservative administration at the combined authority, that like, you know, really caused um, people to view the, the Tees Valley as a whole differently. Mm -hmm. And there has been massive change where people have lost faith in a Labour administration and they've actually seen change because of the combined authority. And I think whoever had been the mayor in the combined authority would have initiated change because of the amount of money that we were given from government, but it's been spearheaded by a Conservative mayor and that has had a huge impact across Hartlepool. I, I, I just worry that, I perhaps worry that um, if, if, if you don't, if you don't elect a Tory, <laughs> then there might be like friction in whatever work groups are bringing those you know, new projects and initiatives to the area. That's like my only So do you concern. think some people might vote Tory because they think they'll get a better deal from government? Yeah. Is it bribery where the Tory government go, if you vote Tory, we're going to give you some money. If you don't vote Tory, we won't. Tough. Well, I'd say yes, but... Was it the same when it was the other way around and it's the Labour government? And, and I say that to balance it out because I've been a long uh, believer in the fact that places like Hartlepool need to be um, marginal seats because otherwise when we're a safe Labour seat, Labour don't, aren't too worried. They'll send the investment to other marginal seats, they'll spend the investment uh -huh. there when they're in government and it's exactly the same when the Tories are in power. So for me, the best bet for Hartlepool would be that we are a marginal seat either way because then we'll get a little bit of attention. What we need is someone who's going to fight and, and work with the Tees Valley Mayor instead of fighting against him, which achieves nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just party politics, rubbish. What we need is, we need put party politics aside, have the MP working with Hartlepool Council and the Mayor of Teesside mm -hmm. to get investment into Hartlepool. And I'm very passionate about that. And I'm, I actually went to the same school, believe it or not, as, uh, as Ben Houchin. Our sense is since locally we have to return a Labour Council um, and we are trying our best to, to find out how we can improve the town um, ourselves without government help because the government help has been pulled many many years ago. If there's no work in West Hartlepool how far should they travel to find employment? Why don't I go down south? Why should I go down south? This is my hometown and this is where I live and this is where I've been brought up and this is where I've been working since I left school and this is where I'm prepared to stop. The, the, the streets of London aren't lined with gold. There's money here when it comes and I'm going to be prepared to stop here and wait till their job arises. So there is a surprising new political kid on the block. They are the Northern Independence Party, a left-wing political party agitating for a new northern nation. And they're very known for their very, very viral online memes. They're fielding their first candidate. She's the former Labour MP, Thelma Walker, in the Hartlepool by-election. But are they just an online phenomenon doomed to failure? I think the actual independence is way, way down the line. That is something that in years to come, there would be a referendum on it. Um, but for me, it's the federal model, it's federalism. I don't know what's going to happen on May the 6th in terms of the outcome of this election. What I do know is that people nationally are talking about that north-south divide. They are talking about the possibility of regionalism and localism. And 
and the control being taken away from Westminster. It's a meme that's gone too far. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke. They're, they're, they're actually hurting... If, if They are actually hurting northern parties and northern towns by um, memeing uh, votes away from, from other people. Um, there are only two options in Hartlepool and it's the Labour Party or it's the Conservatives. Everything else is just uh, smoke and mirrors. Um, so by standing candidates, we don't live in a country of proportional representation, so all they're doing is pulling votes away from uh, parties who will actually deliver the kinds of things they want to see. If the Tories end up winning this seat by a few hundred votes, people go, all you've done is handed the seats to the Conservatives, strengthened a hard right government which has presided over the deaths of up to 150,000 people because of their disastrous mishandling of the, of the crisis. Will that, and that will put people off the Northern Ireland yeah. Party because they'll think if I vote for them, look what happens in, in Hartlepool. I'm not accepting that you're standing against Labour, you're going to hand it. I, I'm not accepting that because I feel I'm not standing against Labour, I'm standing up for democratic socialism. And, and that is the difference. And when I was working with Jeremy and John, the 2017-19 manifestos were, for me, true democratic socialism. They weren't particularly radical. They were, they were the policies needed to end inequality and to end that child poverty and to prevent those queues at the food banks, which are now being normalised across our country. Mm-hmm. And uh, those policies, yes, things went wrong. Yes, we didn't get everything right. But those policies have been seen and can't be unseen. And that's what Labour, current Labour, are frightened of because they were popular policies and they still are popular. In fact, the Tories are pinching a load of them. Don't use any platitudes when when you answer this. (laughs) What is Labour's vision for the country now? What does Labour stand for? Don't say fairness and everything being nice and mother had an apple pie. What is it concretely? What is the vision? People in this election aren't talking though about oh, come Labour's, on, have about a vision. Labour's vision, about, La- about Labour's vision for the country. They're talking about Labour's vision for Hartlepool. Well, it's both. Um, but, okay, what's Labour's vision for Hartlepool? That's okay. unique and different oh, yeah. and distinct. Yeah, so, I will, so the best companies come to Hartlepool to provide the best jobs because we have the best trained people. The Tories disagree with that. Because we've invested in people right from the start of life. And you make that difference to children so by the time they start school, they, they, they're they able, they're not behind their peers, they can read, um, they can, um, you then have small class sizes in, um, in, and, and really good, um, you know, my, my kids are at primary school and they say that, you know, the class sizes are large, the, the head teacher talks to me about, um, uh, have cuts in schools and having to reduce teaching assistance so you you help the most vulnerable children you help children with special educational needs and when kids are you know um um, aren't coming to school, you, you, you send out support workers to find out what's going in the household and you help people to get to a point where they can be, have really great skills, really great training and then employers come to you, not because you've got the lowest taxes, okay. because you've got the best people. There's, there's some direct things, that's what I'm in politics. But do you, I'm genuinely I'm interested, make. do you know that's what the Labour vision for the country is? Well, you asked me what... Uh, but for, the country, for the country, for the country, what's the Labour vision well, for the to country? Repli- that's to, to replicate that and, and you start the best place for a child to be born and the best place to grow old. Paul Williams' hesitancy there seems like a good metaphor for the Labour Party today, lacking any confident vision or, or sense of how it relates to its recent past. Nobody today genuinely believes Labour has a clear sense of what they actually want to do with power. As we are constantly reminded, although the Tories lost their majority in 2017, Labour didn't win. But given it was the first time the party gained seats since 1997, and given it was the biggest increase in the party's vote share since 1945, surely there are lessons to be learned. Why did Labour win such a crushing victory in Hartlepool in 2017, above all else, by attracting Leave voters, when it's struggling to do so today in a by-election after the government catastrophically bungled the pandemic and is enveloped in scandal? If it loses, why? I think if we lost, which I don't think that we will, um, Paul's a great candidate, um, 
I think it's the apathy that, that the town is feeling about being left behind. I don't necessarily think it's a message about the Labour Party. I think it's a message about the town in general. All the issues that people are talking about on the doorstep are local issues. And, I mean, Hartlepool's Hartlepool. You can't necessarily draw any wider inferences from it. If you look at national polling for Labour at the moment, it's dire. It's not just about what happens here. They're bombing <laughs> across the country as a party. Yes, it might send a message out nationally. I think you've got to have a look at the local context of what we've been hit with. And if Labour loses Hartlepool, mm. in my own personal opinion, it's self-inflicted. A lot of other places have, you know, were red and have turned blue uh, in mm. the northeast. Um, I think it's kind of like almost expected by this point. Have you got a prediction about the by-election? Yes. Come on. Come on. I've got to keep it to myself if that's Do all right. Do you really? <laughs> yes. Kind of coax out of you. No, no. Um, no, because as I've said, uh, look, whatever happens, uh, I'm, if I'm still a leader after me, I'm, I'm going to have to work with whoever. Okay. So I've tried oh, no, to keep I'll it straight. I'll ask you another question then. Is the Red Wall going to continue to crumble, do you think? <sighs> it's... It's crumbling. Any Labour leadership would undoubtedly struggle with a traditional electoral coalition which is polarised between younger, socially progressive, economically insecure voters and older, socially conservative, economically relatively secure voters. Brexit both highlighted and exacerbated that divide, and regional inequality means traditional seats long regarded as Labour's beating heart are being emptied of their new core vote, the young. But while Keir Starmer's team have settled on a strategy of emphasising that the Labour leader is not Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson, they have not succeeded in revealing who he is and what he stands for. The Tories, meanwhile, are succeeding in maintaining their triumphant electoral coalition by targeting investment in the communities they have won and encouraging voters to think that if they want central government to shower them with cash, they need to vote Conservative. While Labour-run councils, like the one that used to run Hartlepool, are left managing massive cuts, Tory mayors like Ben Houchin can win popularity by splashing funds. Whether Labour wins or loses in Hartlepool, the party doesn't seem to know who it represents anymore. Without a clear vision, and a Conservative government that is savvy about how it uses the purse strings, Labour's long decline, a decline which was fleetingly upset in 2017, will only continue and power beckons for the Tories for a very, very long time indeed. Take a profit, take the blame